Well, it's three minutes past and it's quite a long paper, so I'll make a start. Um, thanks for coming, the people who are here. Um, so this is quite different to the other papers that I've presented in the past two days. Um, a little bit surprised that the um, Erasmus people aren't here because I think this is quite relevant to their work, but in any case, uh, maybe they'll be looking at the recording on the ISQOL site. Um, so we're looking at scale norming and its implications for welfare analysis, and I'm particularly thinking in particular of economic welfare analysis, um, cost benefit and that sort of stuff, um, but could easily apply to psychological science as well. Okay, so what is scale norming? So scale norming is when you have a change in the qualitative meaning of the points on a respondent scale over time. And I should say that uh, we've got a small audience today, so if anyone wants to jump in at any point to clarify something or make a comment or whatever, just unmute yourself and, and dive right in. Uh, I'm planning to talk for about 40 minutes and then I'll take questions until people are done with all their questions. All right, so a quick change in the qualitative meaning of the points on a respondent scale over time. So what that means is that an eight out of 10 at time one corresponds to a different level of latent life satisfaction or absolute life satisfaction than the same eight out of 10 at time two or three or whatever it might be. So in other literatures, this phenomenon is sometimes called response shift or scale recalibration or scale shift or inconsistent scale use, etc. Let me try to give an example from a study by Stillman et al. So this is a study of Tongan migrants to New Zealand. New Zealand uses a lottery system to allocate visas to migrants from Tonga. So this is a kind of natural experiment setting. Both the migrants and the unsuccessful applicants are interviewed two to five years after the lottery. So two to five years after some people are successful and they migrate to New Zealand and other people are unsuccessful and stay in Tonga. The migrants over this two to five year period have almost all had increases in real incomes on average. So economics would predict that they should have higher levels of life satisfaction. Everyone is asked this welfare question. I don't really know why it's called a welfare ladder and not a wealth ladder, but whatever. Um, please imagine a 10 step ladder where on the bottom, the first step stand the poorest and on the highest step, the 10th stand the rich. On which step are you today? The migrants and the unsuccessful visa applicants are on the same step on average. So I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's either seven out of 10 or eight out of 10. However, the migrants also report being 0.75 rungs higher than when they were last in Tonga on average. The people who stayed in Tonga report no change over time. They say they're exactly the same as they were before. So it appears that the migrants are using a different scale to those who remain behind in Tonga. Now keep in mind that this is a natural experiment. So the only difference on average between these two groups is the migration. So it seems that even though they're giving the same numerical response on the scale, that numerical response may be obfuscating a real change in the welfare of the people who migrated. Imagine if you asked a different question, something like, are you on a higher step now than before you migrated? It seems to me that the answer would surely be yes from the migrants, right? Or equivalently, no, because my ladder has changed. And I think this is quite important for welfare analysis because it seems that the scale response doesn't communicate a real change in your subjectively assessed well-being, right? So furthermore, um, a, Big challenge in this kind of space is separating this sort of scale norming. I would take this as, as scale norming, but there are some other explanations that I'll get to. Separating scale norming from reference point shifts, which is what this is often described as, and from adaptation, both conceptually and empirically. It's quite a challenge, and I'll, I'll try to explain that as I go along. So imagine a similar setup, but with the migrants experiencing increases in their latent life satisfaction rather than in their wealth. So again, the two groups would report the same life satisfaction two to five years after the migration. So maybe they say they're eight out of 10 migrants and eight out of 10, the people who stayed back in Tonga. So again, though, the migrants would say that they are 0.5 steps higher than when they were previously there. So that would suggest that the migrants have a meaningfully higher life satisfaction than prior to migration, but this is obfuscated in their quantitative responses because the qualitative meaning of the scales that they're using has changed between the first wave and the second wave. So this kind of thing is highly pernicious to interpersonal and intertemporal welfare comparisons, because if you think about the migrants as essentially the same people as the Tongans, the migrant scale is no longer comparable to the unsuccessful migrant scale, 
So that means that you have an intergroup or interpersonal incomparability. And the migrant scale from today is incomparable to the scale that they used when they were still in Tonga. So there seems to be an intertemporal incomparability issue as well. Now, I think um, there's quite a lot of empirical evidence for scale norming that I'll get to from vignette studies and response shift studies. But scale norming doesn't seem to be particularly widely appreciated um, among subjective well-being scholars, especially outside psychology. So particularly the old guard of psychology, the, the early generation, like Richard Lucas and these kind of people, they know about this literature and they take it quite seriously. Um, but the younger generation that's just coming through now, my impression is that they mostly think these measurement issues have been resolved. Um, and, and I worry about that because I don't think they've been resolved and we really need to look into them more. Um, it's very rarely considered by papers whether the estimates that they get from their regressions, for example, are biased by scale norming. There's one exception that I've come across, which is this paper by Otto and Stutzer. Um, and that paper is really interesting because it shows how hard it is to control for scale norming, even if you want to. And perhaps this uh, lack of engagement is because of a tendency to see the evidence that might indicate scale norming as clearly indicating cognitive biases instead. And the three biases that are usually mentioned are recall bias and errors of memory, effort justification, and implicit theories of change. Now, I did, these are certainly um, compelling arguments, um, and I think this is something that we need to investigate and try to control for. But at the moment, I think something that might be scale norming is seen clearly as cognitive bias, and instead it should be something might be cognitive bias, and it might be scale norming, and it might be both. Okay. Now, in this context, I think it's worth mentioning critiques, particularly from Gigerenza, that behavioral economics has a bias bias. At the moment, it kind of sees biases everywhere. Um, and I think uh, at this juncture, it's kind of important for us to consider the cognitive complexity of life satisfaction reporting. So we need to temper this behavioral economics perspective with a perspective from cognitive psychology. So subjective well-being scholars assume that life satisfaction reporting is quite straightforward because people answer the questions quite quickly, often in less than 10 seconds. But speed is not the same as simplicity, particularly because it's not clear to the respondent that the researcher wants them to have consistent scales over time. So they can very quickly give you an answer, but it's not clear that they are thinking about maintaining the consistency of their scales over time when they're giving that answer. As we'll see as I go through this paper, I think it's actually very complex to answer these questions in a way that maintains scale consistency, and as such, perceived biases might actually be a function of the measurement instrument, right? in which case uh, it would be kind of on the researcher's part that there is a bias, not on the part of the respondent. I think this is quite an ethically important issue. So a lot of the advocacy around life satisfaction scales in a policy context and in welfare analysis is that we should take subjective responses more seriously. I think it's kind of an oxymoron to say that we should take them more seriously while simultaneously saying that they're full of biases and that only we, the researchers, can see those biases. I mean, if they're so full of bias, then we should use objective measures instead. And I think we really dig our own grave, or not our grave, but dig a hole for ourselves if we just keep dismissing everything as a bias, because that makes this stuff really hard to understand. All right, so what are the innovations in this paper? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to further develop Fleurbet and Blanchet's model of the reporting function, which was originally proposed by Oswald. And this is a cognitive process that maps latent life satisfaction or creates an assessment of satisfaction and then maps that into a scale response. This model works regardless of whether you think life satisfaction is a construct or a latent variable. Um, later on, I'm going to show graphs where I assume that it's a latent variable, but I think this is a, a complex philosophical issue involving qualia and a bunch of other hard problems. Um, so I won't get into that, but in any case, this model works regardless. Using this model, I'm going to explain how this reporting function could give rise to scale norming over time. Then I'm going to use it to provide what I hope is a clear conceptual differentiation of scale norming from adaptation and from reference point shifts. And then I'm going to try to offer some explanations, again, using this conceptual model and some theories from positive psychology to explain why theories of change and effort justification are inextricable from the reporting function. They are fundamentally part of it. So it's very hard. I can see how you would be able to invoke it, but it's very hard to offhandedly invoke these biases as um, a way to say, well, this isn't scale norming, this is an implicit theory of change, because implicit theories of change are fundamental to reporting your life satisfaction. 
Then that leaves recall bias as the main kind of um, thing that might explain these uh, reports that suggest scale norming. Um, and so I then present new empirical evidence from an experiment that tries to control for recall bias and see whether you still find scale norming in the data. And indeed, I do still find scale norming in the data. Okay, so let's talk about this reporting function. So I don't think this notion has been explored very much in psychology in a kind of formal way. Um, but one of the closest descriptions of it I've come across is in Pavard and Dana from 1991, where they say that people construct a standard that they think is appropriate to themselves, and then they compare their life against that standard. So Fleurbe and Bonchet, who are two um, kind of fairly mainstream welfare economists in 2013, um, kind of formalized this model and had a bit more to think about it and tried to mathematize it and make it cleaner. And the model that they present is how subjective well-being can be retrieved with typical questionnaires. And their model takes the following form. They start with a vector, Li, and this is the diversity of states, activities, and possibilities enjoyed or endured by an individual I over the course of their life. So you can think of this vector as all the possible lives that they could have. There's then a function, the reporting function, that maps all these possible lives into a specific scale response. And I see here that there is a typo, which is really annoying. So Li should actually be Ri, and the star is the actual response that the individual gives based on their actual life. So we want to observe the person's actual life relative to the other possible lives that they are taking into consideration, but all we can ever observe is their actual life once it's gone through the reporting function. Now, there are three cognitive problems involved in the reporting function, the scope, ranking, and calibration problems, they're all quite complex cognitive exercises and that might give rise to scale norming over time. All right, so the first one is the scope problem. So the scope problem is what aspects of LI, what aspects of possible lives are things that you consider relevant when reporting your life satisfaction. So for example, do you just consistently think about your own life in a very kind of narrow way or do you also consider your family's situation, your community's situation, your society's situation, for example? Do you just consider the immediate moment? And a lot of the time, subjective well-being scholars say that people are the expert on how they feel right now. But they're also talking about evaluative well-being as something that takes a broader temporal um, perspective. So what is that temporal horizon? Is it right now? Is it last week? Is it the last month or the last year? Now, scale norming would arise if people use different scopes across different survey waves. So for example, you're interviewing the same person every year at the same time, maybe December, right? If you interviewed them in the wake of the 2016 US election, particularly if they were a Democrat, they might be really thinking a lot about the state of society rather than the state of their own life. And that's going to inform the scale that they use and the possible lives that they think about. If you then interviewed them at the same time in 2017, once they'd kind of, um, the media and everything had changed, they might be thinking about other issues. You know, they'd still have the same perspective on the state of society, but the salience of that might not be quite as heavy when they're constructing their scales, right? So they might then focus strictly on their own situation. And these are two different scopes. So the question is, do different people use the same scope each wave? And do they use the same scope as each other? Okay, the ranking problem. If you think about the scope problem as selecting relevant considerations, the ranking problem is then how you weight those considerations. So another way to think about it is how can you arrange various possible lives? So life one, sorry, again, typos, I apologize. I thought I'd fix these slides today. So life A, life B, et cetera, these are in a kind of cloud into an ordered ranking, life one through to life 10. This is quite complex, this process, and it may induce respondents to focus on salient aspects of their lives and overlook or forget other things that they will consider important at other times. So for example, focusing illusions. This is a well-established cognitive bias. Actually, I don't think it is that well established, but there's been a bunch of papers on it. Um, so for example, someone living in the Midwest in America, you interview them in winter, they might think, ah, oh, well, yeah, like life's pretty good, seven out of 10, but like life would be better if the weather was better. So if I lived in California, that would be better because the weather's nicer. So let's think California is eight out of 10. Um, and so cool, if I, if I moved to California, it'd be eight out of 10. But the problem there is that they don't think about each time of the month when they write their rental check and they go, man, my rent is so low, sweet. And that's a function of living in the Midwest. And if they move to California, they'd still have the weather and the weather would make them feel better, but they would now be paying higher rent. And they hadn't considered that when you asked them um, when in the Midwest. 
Similarly, or I should say, subjective well-being scholars often think that you can avoid these kind of issues by removing explicit primes from surveys. So, for example, we don't ask people about politics before we ask them about life satisfaction because that would prime their response. But people will inevitably be self-primed by whatever is currently on their mind. So, for example, someone who most of the time has a really good job satisfaction level, because they have great colleagues, great work-life balance, all the rest of it, but just randomly they're having a bad month at work. And you interview them at that point and you're trying to get their life satisfaction this year relative to last year, for example, or you're trying to compare it certainly to their life satisfaction last year. And because of this bad month at work, they're like, oh, my life sucks, man, my job sucks, right? But actually, if you ask them at any other time, their ranking would be different because they'd be having a different sense of their life, of their job, I should say. All right, so this is the ranking problem graphically. You've got this nebulous collection of possible lives. How do you rank those different lives? Are the salient primes that affect people when they're conducting this consistent over time or do they change quite randomly? And do we just not care about salient primes? I think a lot of this is that uh, you can potentially say, well, there's information in these reports and that's what matters. And I think there's still a lot that we can do with just that approach. But it's very hard to unpack what information we're actually getting. And in order to unpack that, we need to start thinking about things like this ranking problem. All right, the last one is the calibration problem. And this is how individuals translate that ranking they've just created into the ordered response categories on the scale question. All right, so there's a strong framing effect here. The scale's closed. At most, it goes from zero to 10, but maybe there's a lot more possible lives that you want to think about. Maybe there's far fewer possible lives that you want to think about. So how do you map these into the scale response? Many considerations in your life are open, like income, um, or have fuzzy or uncertain limits. So as you transition out of your PhD, for example, and into um, further academic work or drop out of, not drop out, but like choose a different career path and go into some other industry, um, it's not clear where you're gonna land, right? And so at that point, how do you think about your career progression? And how do you think about how your career progression is going to be mapped onto your scale? Similarly with longevity. I mean, I can make an assumption that the best possible life for me is to live to 85, if I then get diagnosed with terminal cancer tomorrow, my best possible life is going to change dramatically. I might just be hoping to make it to 40, right? There's a question then of how to bound the scale. So what is my best possible life? Do I think of it in terms of Jeff Bezos, which is like not possible for me, really, but does seem to be possible for humanity? Or do I think about it as just possible for me? And then do I think about it... Um, if I'm, do I think about miracles? Do I think about big, big lucky things that could happen to me, et cetera? And it's not clear that even if I consistently think about it as best possible life for me, that my um, housemate is not thinking about it as best possible life for Jeff Bezos, in which case we don't really have comparable scales. All right. Now it's important to remember this idea that uncertainty is going to decrease over time. And that I think, I presume would have an effect on how we, the qualitative meaning of these scales. Um, so, for example, in year, oh, again, this is typo, sorry. All right, so think about it this way. So if I have a consistent ordering where I have getting a tenured position at a university as uh, 10 out of 10, uh, and then I have, uh, I'm a PhD student, so I have that as 8 out of 10, and I have getting on the tenure track as 9 out of 10. I think pretty normal for a lot of people coming out of their PhD. Say I'm then successful and I get my tenure track position. We would expect this to increase my subjective well-being, right? Because that is a goal that I wanted. All the goal affirmation literature suggests that when you achieve your goals, you, you get a big kick um, of, of positive emotion, of improved life satisfaction, improved self-esteem, all the rest of it, right? But now at this point, a bunch of uncertainty has diminished because I've got that tenure track job. They're very hard to get. Um, and now I've got it. So I can be certain that I have it. And then I'm also much closer to my 10 out of 10. So now what I might do is I might think, well, the next thing is to think about what steps I need to get through in order to get to my 10 out of 10, which is the tenured position. So then I might move where previously getting a tenure track position was my nine out of 10. Now I might make it my eight out of 10. And I think nine out of 10 is publishing in good journals because that's a step towards getting tenured. And so now I've given eight out of 10 in wave one and eight out of 10 in wave two, but the eight out of 10 in wave two responds to a much higher level of satisfaction than what I was giving the, my eight out of 10 in the previous wave, right? And so this is a calibration issue that I'm mapping my rankings onto the scale in a different way. 
let me try to um, give another example of this, because I think this is probably the easiest way for scale norming to occur. So uh, a kind of well-established finding in the subjective wellbeing literature is that extroverts are happier than introverts. Right now, it's possible that this reflects a real um, difference in latent life satisfaction because extroverts tend to be more social people um, and so they maybe have more friends and we think that social relations um, tend to improve people's subjective well-being. So maybe that's what's going on here and this is a totally benign finding. But maybe a part of the story is just that extroverts have a kind of like positive response bias. So think about your teachers in school who were just generous markers. They might assess a paper exactly the same way in terms of its quality as some other teacher who's just a more stringent marker. And the generous marker will say this is a 90 and the stringent marker will say this is an 80. And they both agree on the quality of the paper. They just map it differently into the mark that they give. It could be a similar thing with introverts and extroverts. So the extroverts just have a positive reporting bias. And so here you have two people with exactly the same latent life satisfaction, exactly the same goals and ambitions. They live the same way but one is an introvert and one is an extrovert, maybe it's possible that the extrovert is just mapping things onto their scale in a more positive way and the introvert in a more negative way. And I think this has a lot of big implications for policy. You know, if it's just a reporting question, then it would be the case that making all the introverts in the world extroverted would be a bad thing. And I, as an introvert, who often finds extroverts a bit overwhelming, would be quite keen to not see more extroverts in the world on the assumption that being extroverted makes you happier. All right, so now to summarize that um, section, the challenge is that we wanna know about LI, the um, vector of things that people care about, and in particular, LI star, which is the life that people actually lead right now and how satisfying that life is. But all we can ever observe is that LI star, once it's gone through the reporting function, which gives us RI, which is the response that someone gives in a year. Now, both, the person's actual life and the reporting function can change over time. And the outcome of that, if the reporting function is changing, is that life satisfaction scale question responses become neither intertemporally nor interpersonally comparable, even orderly. And I think I illustrated that with the, the Tongan Migan stuff. So this might explain some of the findings in the literature. And I'll just bring up one, which is that scale responses have really, I think, super low test retest coefficients of around 0.5 to 0.7. Now, this would be a kind of reasonable test retest coefficient on an annual basis, but we're talking about one day to two weeks. I don't think this much change is occurring in someone's life that their evaluation should be so dramatically different from one day to the next. All right, now I'm going to try to use this model to differentiate conceptually using some graphics that are hopefully quite clear um, between scale norming, adaptation, and reference point shifts. So I think often these are kind of lumped together into one thing um, and scale norming is usually the, the conceptual idea that's left out. Right? The assumption is that these must be cognitive processes relating to life satisfaction, not cognitive processes relating to reporting. And it's important to understand that these are both cognitive, cognitive things, right? But they're separate cognitive issues. All right, so scale norming kind of looks like this. On the y-axis, we have latent life satisfaction which maybe doesn't exist, maybe it's a construct that you come up with on the spot, but let's assume that there's this thing, latent life satisfaction, like how satisfied are you with your life and you carry this around with you all the time. And here it's running from zero to infinity, right? Your life can just get better and better and better. And I think about this myself a lot, but I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. Um, so here we have a person whose life satisfaction does not change, their latent life satisfaction does not change over five waves of a survey. So on the x-axis, we have these annual waves of something like HILDA or the GSOP or the British Household Panel Study, something like that. The red lines indicate the scale that this person is using in each year. And we see that despite their life satisfaction not changing, their response on that scale does change. So in the first year, maybe what's going on is that they're thinking about what is possible for humanity as their best possible life, their 10 out of 10. And so in that case, they haven't achieved what's most possible for humanity. They're not an astronaut or a pop star or whatever it might be. And so they say they're four out of 10. In the second year though, in the third year, they're thinking more in terms of what's possible for them. And they think, well, I've kind of achieved quite a lot of my potential. So maybe I'm a six out of 10. And then by the fourth year, they're back to thinking about what's society. So depending on that different uh, calibration, you get very different scale responses. But those scale responses are not reflective of the underlying latent life satisfaction, which from a welfare analysis point of view is what we're interested in. 
Okay, now one way that you might get these kind of scale norming effects that's highly pernicious, I think, to welfare analysis is ceiling effects, which are a pretty common phenomenon in quality of life studies. So this is the idea that once you get up towards the top of your scale, you're kind of running out of space. So what I've depicted here is someone who initially is seven out of 10 uh, in their latent life satisfaction, and that's exactly what they report on their scale. And then over time, their life just keeps getting better and better, and so their life satisfaction keeps improving. So in the second wave, it's eight out of 10. By the third wave though, it's equivalent to 10 out of 10 from their original scale. But they're thinking to themselves, well, my life could still get better. So they don't wanna say 10 out of 10 because that implies that it's perfect. They don't want any changes, right? Best possible life. So what they do instead, instead of giving 10 out of 10 is they say eight out of 10 again and just change the scale that they used. So you can see that the scale shifts up on the graphic and that keeps occurring as we go up. So if I'm the researcher, all I observe is 7888. Eight, 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 and I think, wow, this person's life is not improving, but actually it's improving a lot. And so if we're trying to measure social progress with these kind of longitudinal analysis of life satisfaction, this could be really obscuring a lot of progress that is occurring. Um, and I do, as I say, I think about this a lot in my own life because um, I'm very fortunate and very privileged and my life is awesome. Um, so like when I was an undergrad, I would have said that I was eight out of 10. And life has really just gotten much better since then. Um, and by the time I was a PhD student, I would have been 18 out of 10. And now uh, as a postdoc at Cambridge, I'm living like genuinely my wildest dreams. So now I'm like 30 out of 10. Uh, and there's no way I could report this without changing my original scale because I can still see my life getting better. Okay, so one maybe one last point to mention here is we often consider this the hedonic treadmill. Like I've gotten to Cambridge, so now I think, uh, um, I need to get to professor. And so my scale is changing and I'm not feeling as good about my life, but I am. I feel fantastic about my life, much better than I used to. The difference is that I can't communicate that on the instrument that you're presenting me. And so the problem is not with me or my psychology, it's with the measurement instrument that we're using. Let's contrast this with adaptation. So adaptation does not refer to a change in the reporting scale that you're using. It refers to a change in your actual life satisfaction, your latent life satisfaction. So the idea here is that this person uses the same scale consistently across the five years. At time two, they have some unfortunate accident. You know, maybe they receive a facial scar in some way, right? And this facial scar makes them very upset. They, they look in the mirror and they think, oh, I'm hideous, right? And so their, their life satisfaction falls to three. And then over time, they start to acclimatize to this in a cognitive way. So they get used to their image in the mirror, their friends get used to the way they look, and so they don't really um, notice it on their face anymore. And, and when they interact, and strangers on the street might still occasionally have a reaction, but it doesn't bother this person anymore. And so over the next two waves of the survey, their life satisfaction is rising, and so is their scale response. And in this case, the scale response actually tracks effectively that change. So the key point here is that adaptation is a change in feelings, not a change in your reporting style. Scale norming is a change in your reporting style, not a change in your feelings. Now, the really tricky thing is that reference point shifts are both at the same time, or a kind of interrelationship of feelings and your reporting function. So the way I would describe reference point shifts is that you scale norm, and this change in your scale makes you miserable. So it actually has an effect on your feelings, and so your latent life satisfaction changes. So let me give a, a kind of contrived example. So we have an individual here who wants to have a $1 million house. And right now they don't, so they're a six out of 10. And they get closer to it, and eventually they get their $1 million house at time three. And as we might expect from the goal attainment literature, their life satisfaction rises to eight out of 10. And it persists for a whole year. They're still really happy about their $1 million house. But then in the fifth year, for whatever reason, they decide that it'd be even better if they had a $1.5 million house. You know, it'd be nice to have a pool or whatever it is. And then the feeling that they can't afford this $1.5 million house, they can't realize their dream, actually makes them miserable. And so not only has the scale changed, so $1.5 million house replaces $1 million house as an eight out of 10 on the scale, but this change in the scale provokes feelings. And so their latent life satisfaction falls to six out of 10. Now you can have simultaneously situations where people are adapting to things, scale norming without that scale norming having an effect on their feelings and the situation where they are scale norming and it's having an effect on their feelings. 
So reference point shifts are a whole separate class of cognitive phenomena. And it'd be very hard to tease these three things apart. All right, so what are the implications of this kind of research? So one is I think if scale norming is severe and pernicious, it seems to me like it really makes intergroup comparisons of life satisfaction very difficult, assuming that those groups are using different scales. So for example, there's a, a study by Captain et al. Um, where they use vignettes to correct for discrepant scales between Dutch respondents and American respondents. And after doing this, an initial discrepancy in the income satisfaction of these two um, nations disappears, right? So once you correct for the scale, it seems that they're equally as satisfied with their income, right? So that intergroup comparison that we did in the raw data turns out to be a statistical artifact. This kind of thing generalizes then to interpersonal comparisons as well. It's quite possible that if you're comparing me to um, someone in a very different part of England, we're just using very different scales. And so it's not really straightforward to say that my eight means the same thing as that person's eight. Now, well-being cost-benefit analysis, which is something that a lot of people are promoting in, in the public policy space for a range of reasons, um, a lot of which are very good reasons, I think, um, is really, uh, kind of acutely affected by um, this scale norming issue. So scale norming relies on quite precise uh, estimates of the effect of certain changes and then aggregating those um, effects up to a group level. And so here you've got different um, effects on different people. They're all using different scales and then you aggregate them up into a group and you're just compounding the measurement error the whole time. Okay. So what about the empirical evidence? I mean, I've presented all this theory, but maybe it's all bollocks. Um, and actually, uh, there's no such thing as scale norming. And when we look at the data, we don't see it. Um, now, uh, I don't think there's been really super high quality studies of scale norming, and I'm trying to get some funding at the moment to hopefully do one that is a bit more high quality. But that is not to say that there isn't already quite a lot of evidence for this out there. So the first block of evidence comes from vignette studies. I've already mentioned one paper by Captain et al. There's a very closely related paper from three years earlier where they look at the marginal effect of income on life satisfaction. And again, after controlling for this difference in scale use between Dutch people and Americans, they find that that difference in the marginal um, effect disappears. Mallory Montgomery has a paper looking at the gender gap in life satisfaction, and she finds that once she controls for different scale use between men and women, that gender gap halves. Angelini et al. find large differences in scale use across 10 European countries, and after introducing controls using vignettes for this discrepant scale use, Denmark falls from being the most satisfied country to being the fifth most satisfied country. Now, I would note though that there are a lot of methodological problems with vignette studies, and there's a paper that's about to be published as a working paper by um, Kasper Kaiser, and I think Martin Bendrick is the co-author um, that goes through a lot of, a lot of this literature and, and the issues with it. Um, there's also a big bunch of evidence from response shift studies. And this is a very long and old literature. Like it goes back to Howard and Daly in 1979, who were writing in, in personality and social psychology, who said that there might be a lot of problems throughout quality of life studies and psychological assessment pertaining to response shift. Um, Swartz and Sprangers did a big summary of this literature in 2000. And the research is, is ongoing. It's quite a lively um, discussion in quality of life studies in the medical space. Now, my impression is that there's not a lot of awareness or recognition of this literature among subjective well-being scholars, especially in happiness economics, um, and especially among the younger generation. Um, maybe that's because it's mostly published in medical journals. Um, maybe it's because they don't use life satisfaction scales. Um, I'm not really sure. I don't think it really matters in any case. Um, what I'm going to try to do in the next part of the paper is to port this literature across to life satisfaction scales, so show how it's conceptually equivalent. Um, and part of the benefit of this, um, of this uh, activity is that it reveals these three cognitive biases that I mentioned earlier, recall bias, implicit theories of change, and um, effort justification that are often used as explanations for data that might otherwise support um, the existence of scale norm. All right, so what is response shift? There's a philosophical paper by McClymans et al. Um, that goes through some of the details here. Oh, sorry, that, goes, that provides an anecdotal example to illustrate. So they, they talk about a man, a real man, um, who's going through chemotherapy and was asked, were you limited in pursuing your hobbies or other leisure activities? 
And this man said, well, my hobby is working in the garden and, and that's very difficult right now. So there's been quite a bit of um, limitations in me pursuing my hobbies and leisure activities. And then he's asked again four years late, four months later, sorry, four weeks, one month later, how it's all going. And he says, well, I'm reading at the moment. Gardening is just not possible anymore. Um, so I'm a little affected. So previously he said quite a bit and now it's only a little, but it seems like he's not gardening at all. So what's going on here? Um, what is his quality of life? So a standard economic assessment would be, well, on revealed preference, he prefers gardening to reading. Otherwise, when both were available, he would have read. But it seems that he only reads when gardening is not available. So if he's only reading now, he must be much worse off than before. Or well, not much, but like ordinarily worse off. But it's also possible that he's adapted. You know, maybe when he started reading, he discovered how much he enjoys reading. And it's really quite a good substitute for gardening, even though it's a very different activity. But it's also possible that his scales have changed, right? He's no longer even thinking that gardening is possible. And so the scale has shifted downwards. And I think this would be quite a strong explanation for a lot of the studies that we observe around spinal cord injury, for example, which has pretty big effects on people's life satisfaction that they don't adapt to. But these effects are like one point on a scale from one to 10. That seems really small to me for someone becoming a paraplegic. Um, I've had a spinal injury in my life, much more minor than having um, a, uh, a paraplegia incident. Um, and it did affect my personality and my character a lot. And I just can't imagine that that would be something that people adapt to quickly. Anyway, Ubel et al. then uh, wrote a paper in 2010 making a plea for conceptual clarity in the response shift area where they said that response shift studies lumps together sources of measurement error, such as scale recalibration, with true causes of changing quality of life, such as hedonic adaptation. So this seems to me completely parallel to what I've been saying up to now about how scale norming would manifest in life satisfaction scales. So it's not clear when you have a change in the reporting and when you have a change in the feeling. And these are two things that we need to be able to separate, and we can't do that with just a life satisfaction scale. We're going to need to have some additional instruments to tease these things apart. Right, how big are these effects? So Schwartz et al. did a meta-analysis of 19 response shift studies, and they found, and I think this is very encouraging, that the effect sizes were quite modest, so they only really change, if you accounted for scale norming, you would find that small effect sizes are actually moderate, and moderate effect sizes are actually large. The other thing that they found is that generally scale norming doesn't change the direction or the sign of a change. So if an intervention has a positive effect, then scale norming might mute that effect, but it doesn't make it go negative. And I think this is quite encouraging again for the research agenda, because it means that you can assess the impact of things on life satisfaction, even in the presence of scale norming. You just can't be too confident about your effect sizes. But unfortunately, it's exactly effect sizes that we need for cost-benefit analysis. The other thing I'd note here is that most of these response shift studies, and in the medical context, so you're talking about two time periods, you know, before treatment and after treatment, before surgery and after surgery. If you have scale norming over that time horizon, presumably in subsequent years, there are other things that come in that would also provoke scale norming. And so we would expect the scale norming problem to compound over time, which is quite problematic for longitudinal studies. All right. Now, most response shift studies rely on this thing called the then test, which is similar to Stillman et al.'s question about how did you feel back then. And this has a lot of issues. I'm not going to read this quote. I just want to pull out a few key things here, which is that the then test is susceptible to recall bias. It's, sub, it's susceptible to effort justification and implicit theories of change. So there's this large body of evidence for scale norming that comes out of this then test literature, but a lot of people don't take it particularly seriously because of these cognitive bias issues. So I want to see whether these are really good uh, reasons to not be too concerned about scale norming. So let me just explain these in a bit of detail first. So recall bias is an error of memory. You might just kind of be nostalgic for the past and you'll focus on things that are salient in your memory and forget a lot of other things that were going on in your life in the past. So we shouldn't, ex and you know, there's plenty of evidence to show that people do have um, a kind of positive glow on past events. And, and a lot of this is used in the um, savoring and mindfulness literature to help people feel better. And, and step away from negative memories. Um, effort justification is when you justify sacrifices that you made to achieve a goal by elevating the attractiveness of that goal. So you worked really hard to be an astronaut and now you're an astronaut. So you say that it's awesome to be an astronaut, but actually 
It's not that great. Um, and then finally, we have implicit theories of change. And there's a wonderful um, representation of this from Ross's study, which really kind of mirrors the Tong and migrant study in a very nice way. So what he did was that he assessed people's study skills and he both asked them what their study skills are. How do you rate your ability to study? And he also got objective measures of how effectively people study. Then he put them through a training program and he found that this training program had no effect. So not only did people say that they had the same study skills as they had in the past, six out of 10, six out of 10, but also the objective measures suggested that their study skills were identical. And yet when he asked the participants whether they thought the program had improved their study skills, they said yes. Now this might be a social desirability bias, but it also might just be this effort, this implicit theory of change. Well, I've gone through a study skills training session, so I must have learned something. My study skills must be better. Right? So this is similar to the Tongan migrants from earlier, right? So it might be the case that the migrants have gone through this whole rigmarole of migration. And so when you ask them, are you better? They say, well, yeah, yeah, I must be better. I must be better, right? Like I've migrated, I've got more money. I must be better. And this might be a kind of heuristic rather than a real um, change in their life satisfaction. All right. But then the question is, well, how easy is it to map these cognitive biases onto life satisfaction reporting? And my conjecture is it's actually very difficult. So once you start thinking about how these would manifest in life satisfaction reporting over time, you start to run into some conceptually tricky issues. So the first thing to note is that there's no objective measure against which to assess effort justification. So in the response shift literature, you're dealing with medical situations. So you often have something like whether someone can climb a flight of stairs and someone says, yeah, my hip replacement has made things much better, but they still can't get up the stairs. So, you know, objectively that, that they're lying or like they're lying to themselves. They haven't gotten better. Right? But in the case of subjective well-being, we often don't have an objective thing to compare to. And indeed the whole point of the exercise is to see what people subjectively think, not to look at the objective measures. So that we kind of, force ourselves to take the subjective account seriously. And if subjectively the person says, I'm better than I was before, but is giving you the same scale response, then there seems to be scale norm. Implicit theories of change, I think are even trickier because these are fundamental to the reporting function. I mean, how can you construct a standard against which to judge your life if you don't have some notion of where you were, where you are and where you wanna be? That's fundamental to the ranking problem. So if I'm thinking about, for example, the example I gave earlier of, of being a PhD student and then a postdoc and then on the tenure track, I mean, that's a pretty simple way to construct a scale and it involves an implicit theory of change. Right? If, as you step through those ladders, you've got to go up and up and up and that's an implicit theory of change. So certainly you could have erroneous theories of change infecting scale responses, but it's not enough to simply say, well, this could just be a theory of change. You have to demonstrate that. You have to find out what theory of change people are using and whether that is an erroneous or a benign theory of change. I think it's also worth underlining that theories of change are like a really omnipresent theme in a lot of the positive psychology literature. So narrative therapy works by giving people an implicit theory of change with which to make sense of their life. The goal setting literature, which is huge and generally finds that achieving goals improves people's life satisfaction, is inherently about theories of change that people have about personal growth. And same thing in the self-actualization literature and the eudaimonic literature from, for example, self-determination theory, which talks about people integrating more and more ideas into their life and growing as a person. These are all things that are associated with implicit theories of change. So it's not clear to me that this is a straightforward cognitive bias that you can just use to dismiss this evidence. All right, so that leaves recall bias. And I think recall bias is really the hard one. Um, and it's very difficult to control for, and it's very easy for it to um, create the impression of scale norming when actually it's just, just people um, not thinking very deeply about what they're doing. Um, so how could we start to get at recall bias and how could we start to get at scale norming? So I'm gonna show you an experiment that I've run um, that I hope controls for recall bias to some extent at least, um, and we still find scale norming. So the intuition for this experiment is the following. So when you're doing longitudinal studies of life satisfaction, you ask people every year their life satisfaction on a scale from one to 10 in the case of Hilda, and then you plot these responses against each other in, in a time series. And that's what I've represented here on this graph. So this is the first 10 years of the Australian Social Survey, life satisfaction one to 10 on the y-axis, and you can see this flat line 
and this flat line is very common in all the OECD's social surveys, basically. So Britain has the same flat line, the US has the same flat line, etc. And you can get variation, but it's usually very tiny. Okay, so if scale norming is occurring over time, then we might expect to see a different shape if you kind of force the respondent to use a single scale to describe a longer period of time. And so that's what we, that's what I used to inform this experiment. So I gave people this thing that I call a life satisfaction plot. And I say to them, like, think about the last 10 years of your life and just draw a line for me that represents the trends in your life satisfaction. So high to low, we're not really interested in the scale, we're interested in, in the trend, right? We're interested in relative changes not so much the absolute number, okay? But I do do a robustness check where we give 200 people a scale and it doesn't affect anything. So the idea here is that this person thinking at one time period about the last 10 years will apply a single scale to that last 10 year period. Okay, we then gave them two other questions. So it's just a very simple three question survey. So from Hilda, all things considered, how satisfied are you with your life at this time on a scale from one to 10? It's a normal life satisfaction question. And then this retrospective then test type question. Think back to 10 years ago, meditate for a moment on the activities you did, the concerns you had, the good and bad things that were in your life and how happy or sad you were. Place yourself back in your mind at the time. 10 years ago, what would you have answered to the following question? All things considered, how satisfied with your life on a scale from one to 10? We administered this survey to two groups. I keep saying we, but this is my paper. <laughs> Um, about 300 master's students at an R1 university. And most of these master's students in Australia are actually um, foreign students um, from, on scholarship and on Australian government scholarships. Um, so they're a, a purposeful sample, not at all representative. But the idea is that most of these people have had very sustained increases in their quality of life over the last 10 years. Most of them are in their 30s. Um, and so if anyone's going to have ceiling effects kicking in, it's these people. So we would expect scale norming to turn up more in the student sample than in the next sample, which was just over a thousand Australians representative on age, region, and gender. And this panel was collected online um, using Ipsos Ivy, which is a kind of very well regarded um, market research company. And then we generate three variables. So the first is net change. Net change is in the plot. So the, the line graph. And the idea is that net change is the difference between where they ended up on that plot and where they started on that plot. So you could think about it as just time 10 minus time one, except that some people gave very kind of truncated um, graphs. And so if I use that methodology, I'd, I'd lose out on a lot of those people. So instead we have this quite convoluted equation to calculate that net change. Then you've got the scale change, which is just the difference between the life satisfaction that they have now and the life satisfaction that they said they had 10 years ago. And then finally, we have the total change, which is just the volume of change that we see, the kind of volatility in their plot. And that's using the absolute value of year on year changes. So this is an example of, of one of the respondents from the student survey. Um, the student survey was done by hand. Um, the students can look at all three questions, flip it around, whatever. The online sample is done online using a, a box ticking method. Um, and the online sample was part of like 40 questions and the three questions were at different points in the survey and people couldn't go back and forth. So we use that as a robustness check, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. I'll come back to that a bit later. So this person says that they started off quite low. There's a fair bit of volatility in their scale. And then by the end, their life satisfaction is really quite high. But it seems if I was to put a 10 by 10 grid onto this plot and try to pluck out, um, one to 10 on the numbers over the 10 years, then this person would have an increase of five points on their plot. And yet, if you look down the bottom, they said that their life satisfaction 10 years ago was a seven and their life satisfaction today is also seven. So there's been zero change in their scale response, even though in their plot, they say that their life satisfaction has increased. So one interpretation of this is that they're using a different scale today than they would have used 10 years ago. I'll skip through the summary statistics, but I'm happy to come back to them. Maybe the one interesting one is that you see in the student sample, which is the line at the bottom, there's a lot more improvement in life satisfaction over time than in the online response, which is the line at the top. Uh, you still see a bit of increase in the line at the top, but that top line is pretty similar to Hilda, I would say. Okay, 
So let me do an analysis of scale norming. How much scale norming do we see in this data? Then I'll talk a bit about adaptation and then I'll, I'll discuss the results in terms of um, scale norming. So one way of thinking about scale norming is that if you have a strong trend in the plot, which is what we just saw in that earlier graphic that doesn't show up in the scale response, which is again what we saw, that might indicate scale norm. So what we do is we start with a loose definition of this phenomenon and then we gradually tighten it. So the first definition is a net change, so a change in the plot of at least one standard deviation, which in the full sample is uh, a 3.5 net change. So that's a fairly large um, change when you consider that the mean is less than one. Okay. And then a scale change of less than or equal to one. Right? This is a very loose definition. And even with this very loose definition, we only pick up about 157 candidates, which is only 12% of the sample. And a lot of these people are making very reasonable changes, very reasonable responses, I should say. So I think this is quite encouraging. Not a lot of scale norming. Then I tighten the definition to what I call strong scale norming, which is where you have to have at least a standard deviation of net change uh, and less than, so a scale change of zero, essentially. And that leaves 71 candidates. And I think these people are scale norming. So that person that we saw above, they would be um, counted in this, um, in this uh, definition. And I think that's kind of indicative of scale norming. So cool, but only about 71 candidates, so 5%. So again, I mean, quite encouraging. These are not high numbers. If I go to a heavy definition that's really stringent, where I think at least two standard deviations, so a seven point net change, which is like just a straight line going up um, and no scale change, then we get 20 candidates, which is less than 2% of the sample. Right, a couple more um, groups that you might want to include. So you can think of a wide norming definition. So this is people that have had a huge change and only a small change in their scale. So it's debatable whether these people are scale norming. I'm tempted to think they are, but I'm of course biased to see scale norming everywhere. So these people have two standard deviations of, of um, net change in their plots and only one or less scale change. And we get 11 new unique candidates when we do this. And then the big one, which really blew me away when I saw this, <laughs> is reverses. So these are people whose plot goes in one direction, like it goes up, and their scale change goes in the opposite direction. Um, so I'll give you an example here. So this person's plot is really just going up, right? Um, there's, a, there's a dip at the end, certainly, um, but it seems to be higher than at the start, indisputably, right? Four and a half points is quite a large change. And yet their life satisfaction 10 years ago was eight, and their life satisfaction today is only a four. So you might think, well, this person's just trolling me, and that's possible, but there's 103 candidates like this in the sample. Um, so if I add these reverses together with the 11 wide norming people and the um, medium or the strong definition of, of scale norming, then I get 180 candidates from the full sample, which is about 13.6%. And I think that's starting to be a bit more of a worrying number. And that number is similar by subsample. So we've got 7.6 in the students and 6.1 in the online. So they're splitting fairly evenly between those two groups. I would have expected the students to have a bit more because as I said, they were a purposeful sample. What about adaptation then? So one of the implicit arguments of this paper is that we might see adaptation as fast and strong for the most part. And it might actually be that this set point adaptation is a function of the measurement instrument we're using, not a function of people's actual uh, latent life satisfaction. So one way to look at this is to see whether we get different trends in um, adaptation in the plots to in um, say Hilda scales. So again, what we do is we, we use a loose definition and then we gradually tighten that to see how, how much it takes to make the effect disappear. So the loose definition we say, um, actually I'm just gonna jump ahead to the, the um, tighter definition. So say we have a total change of greater than one standard deviation. So this is about five points or five and a half points of um, volume or volatility in the scale. So quite a lot of change occurring, um, but a net change of less than or equal to one, a scale change of less than one. So the idea here is that this person has had a shock that they're gonna adapt to. Have they actually in fact adapted? So going boom, did it come back down? Which is what scale norming would suggest. Oh, sorry, what adaptation theory and set point theory would suggest that over 10 years, you should have plenty of time to adapt. Most of that literature is saying two to five years for almost full adaptation. 
in most cases. So if I use this tight definition, I get 640 potential people, so people that have had enough total change to qualify, and only 75 of them seem to have adapted back. So that's 12% of the potential candidates. And that seems to me like a very small number. If I adopt a wide definition where I, I say, well, maybe some people have had a huge change and they just haven't had enough time to come back down. So I say maybe two volumes of two standard deviations of, of um, change, but, and they haven't adapted all the way. So we've got a net change of less than one standard deviation, so less than three and a half, and a scale change of less than one. And still um, here, interestingly, we see a much larger number. Um, so about 30% of these people, of these candidates, has adapted. So one question I have is, well, maybe people only adapt to big shocks. And it's possible that we have a kind of erroneous understanding here because most of the literature looks at big shocks like spinal injury and divorce and that sort of thing. Maybe people don't adapt to more kind of mundane stuff. I think this would be interesting to pursue further. All right, so let me turn to the discussion quickly. So, I mean, I'm looking at, I'm asking people to recall 10 years of their life. Isn't there recall bias everywhere? How can I say that there is not recall bias or that I've controlled for recall bias? Well, the reason why I think you can say that if this is not explainable by recall bias is that the recall bias should affect the plots and the scale simultaneously, especially in this case of the students because they just get one piece of paper with the three questions on it. They can see all three questions, they can go back and forth to make sure their answer is consistent. If they think about, if they think back over the last 10 years and they have an error of memory, it's going to affect the scale response they gave 10 years ago and the plot of the last 10 years simultaneously. And the key issue is not whether there's recall bias, but that there is a discrepancy between the scale and the plot. And so it's irrelevant whether recall bias is everywhere here. What matters is the discrepancy. And so, and as I said, indeed, we see that the students who, who get the um, questions all at once have more scale norming than the online sample. A couple of other robustness checks we did. We gave 200 online respondents a scale labeled from one to 10. It didn't seem to have any effect on their responses. One concern that you might have is, well, this question with the plot is really quite complicated. You've got to sort of rank 10 years of your life and et cetera, it might be quite hard. It doesn't take people particularly long to answer this question. The median time is 61 seconds. That's not super overwhelming. So the average time to answer the life satisfaction right now question is 10 seconds. If you multiply that by 10, it should take twice as long. Um, and if uh, the recall question takes 24 seconds to answer. So I actually find that a um, encouraging sign. It means that people really did spend a lot of time meditating on what their life was like 10 years ago before they answered this question. Um, Permuting the question order, um, so changing the order in which we gave people the questions, we did that um, randomly at the individual level and at the class level. So we had six different classes of students and we gave each class the questions in a different order. Didn't seem to have any effect on the results. All right, so some takeaways here and then I'll, I'll move to question and answer. So it seems to me from this experiment that people can experience sustained trends in one direction in their life satisfaction without that showing up in their scale responses. Indeed, their scale responses can often go in the opposite direction. This discrepancy should really make us cautious about a lot of the views that we hold quite strongly at the moment, like the speed and intensity of adaptation, the effect size of a lot of interventions in the life satisfaction space, applying life satisfaction results to public policy, and I'm thinking in particular of cost-benefit analysis using life satisfaction. I think we need to conduct more research into scale norming before we jump ahead. Scale norming could be highly pernicious to a lot of these findings. Um, so I think the Eastland paradox could easily be an artifact of discrepant scales between people in developing countries and people in developed countries and middle income countries and all the other um, shades of development that you want to use. The U-shape effect in age could be about differences in scale use between elderly and middle-aged people. Set point theory, um, to me, may, may be just a function of people, if you give them a one to 10 scale, there might be a cognitive tendency, indeed a bias, to report eight out of 10 or seven out of 10 for the most part on that one to 10 scale. But if you don't give people a bounded scale, as you do in the plot, you might get very different phenomena. You might not see set points at all. So I think we really need to look into this quite a bit more. More generally though, I, I definitely don't think I've presented conclusive research for scale norming here, um, but I do think that 
hopefully what I've said convinces people that we should not assume that people are biased and that we don't need to worry about this um, and that it's clearly biased. What we should instead say is that this might be biased or it might be scale norming and we really need to kind of try to include additional questions or, or do an analysis in some way of whether our results can be explained by scale norming rather than by cognitive biases. Okay, um, I will stop there. Thanks for listening. That was quite a long uh, talk by me and I, I will stop and, and take questions from anyone who wants to ask anything. So please go ahead. Hi, Mark. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Great. Okay. Uh, well, one thing I was wondering, and this is probably a bit of an annoying question, but what what instrument would you um, generate or create that you think would be best suited to like address scale norming? Do you think there's something that could be done in terms of designing a questionnaire that can mitigate what's happening with scale norming, if it's a thing? Um, so I'm experimenting with stuff at the moment. So we have quite a long list uh, of ideas for how we might start to at least get at this phenomenon. Um, I don't really have an idea yet as to uh, how you could um, introduce, say, one extra question into the British Household Panel Survey or something that would allow you to just quickly control for scale shift. But what we're experimenting with is getting people at time one to tell us in detail what their scale is. Um, so giving them, say, like a tweet per box, per point on their scale to tell us qualitatively what it means to them. And then at time two, um, we ask them what their life satisfaction is, of course. We, we might ask them what they think their life satisfaction was a year ago and whether they remember what they said a year ago. And then we present them the scale that they used a year ago in the rich detail that they gave us. And we say, on this scale, what life satisfaction do you have now? Um, and on this scale, what life satisfaction did you have a year ago? Um, and using this kind of information, we hope that we can at least um, start to look at the extent to which people have scale norming, the extent to which the implicit theories of change that they have are consistent over time, um, the extent to which they have recall bias. Um, so if they actually remember very effectively what um, life satisfaction they had a year ago, I think that would suggest that a lot of the evidence that already exists um, that is dismissed as a function of recall bias is actually um, evidence of scale norming. Um, but it might be that they have terrible memory. Um, so I've been talking to a lot of surveyors recently and they've all said that like, yeah, people have terrible memory. Like if you ask them, um, questions at the start of a survey and then you ask them the same question at the end of a survey, they give a different answer um, and things like that. Um, so I, I'm quite curious to see what comes out in the results. Okay, uh, yeah, that, that actually, you actually answered my second question. That's, um, so what, what, what it sounds like you're going to do is what I hoped you would do. So I'm very okay. interested to see the, see the results of that. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great, yeah, no worries. Happy to take any more questions? Hi, Mark. Hi, Claire. How are you? Uh, I don't really have an interesting question, I'm afraid. And I oh, that's all right. Amazing. But um, are you putting the recording anywhere? Because I would really like to watch this again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I send it to the ISQAL's office, and then I think they should upload it in the next uh, couple of days. I can email you the link if you want. Okay, awesome. Um, thanks a lot. That's a really like great resource to have. Okay, thanks, Claire. Cheers. Cheers. Anybody else? Caroline, any questions? Uh, no, but thank you. It's been really, really interesting. Um, I don't know why there's not more people here. Yeah. Um, it's weird. Um, I've, I actually applied for funding. I wasn't successful because most of us are not successful with these things. Um, but uh, to do sort of cognitive interviewing. Oh, um, yeah, cool. With regards to life satisfaction and mental well-being and some of the other scales that are used in a lot of these big surveys, just to see what are people using mm. as their norm and their um all these all these words you use that i had never thought of before like scope and ranking it's brilliant that's a really good okay. way of describing yeah, it I'm I'm again um so yeah i don't know what you what you think about that and whether you've done anything like that um so a bit sort of yeah you're taking them through the scale and you're saying right here's life satisfaction scale 
what are you using? How are you? Yeah, talk me through your process. Um, if that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. Think so we've got some... the other name for it. Think aloud method methods. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm interested. So I'd be very interested in hearing kind of um, what you wanted to propose. So um, we're kind of putting in for grants left, right, and center on this stuff at the moment. Um, <laughs> so if you have uh, ideas, we should we should have a conversation. Um, and I know so Felicia Hooper, who um, I've had a lot of conversations with about this, she thought that one of the main things missing from this space was exactly what you described, like some cognitive interviewing. So like some attempt to kind of uh, unpack what process people go through. And, and I know that the quantitative researchers in this space are very reluctant to do that because they think you're just going to get social desirability responding and and it's going to be a mess and there's not going to be any way to really kind of get a strong handle on what people are doing and try to quantify that. And I'm sympathetic to those concerns, but I think that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. You should start, you should do at least one instance of cognitive interviewing and then see what turns up. And then you can start to think about whether there's ways to pin it down a bit more. Um, so I, I would like to um, do more of that sort of thing and, and qualitative research and stuff. Um, at the moment, our, our approach is to try to get people to tweet it out for us and then we're going to read it back to them and we'll try to use um, some text analysis software or something like that to uh, analyse the responses that we get. Um, the other thing uh, that we're going to try to do is um, to get people, we're going to use quadratic voting, um, which is a, a means to get people to kind of emphasise certain things relative to other things to assess what people's scope is each wave. Um, so we'll give them sliders and they'll be able to tell us how much they thought about themselves or their family or their society this year, this month, this week, whatever. Um, and we'll ensure that they can't just put everything at maximum. They have to kind of think about what one was more salient um, or they can put everything at 30, something like that. Um, so we're still thinking about it, but um, got a lot of ideas in the pipeline. So it's just a question of cash and uh, <laughs> making sure that we don't um, miss something critical. So I'm trying to solicit a lot of opinion on what we're doing. I was um, particularly interested in the, um, I, I've mostly worked in aging research mm -hmm. um, and then I've, I've, I'm now a lecturer. So obviously I'm surrounded by students. So I'm always interested now in the difference between those mm. two populations, which are hugely different. Um, and I've always thought, you know, when students have come to me as dissertation supervisor and they said, what should I use to measure um, subjective well-being? I generally go for like the Warwick Edinburgh or something. Oh, yeah, so sure. I, I worry that um, like satisfaction with life scale people mm -hmm. who are 18 or 19 and haven't achieved what they want yet are going to rate their life satisfaction really low. But actually it's just because of the point of life that they're at. at. So all of this stuff about the, the norming and the scaling is really interesting. And that's mm. kind of what I wanted to look at with the cognitive interviewing. Right. To see what is going on. Is it actually a really good scale to use for uh, yeah, all these different populations, but do we mm. need to, bear in mind what they're using as their, yeah. As, as yeah, their as their standards. standards. <laughs> so I, reflecting on my on myself, so like a sample of one, um, <laughs> I think when I was an undergrad, I would have used a much more hedonic scale to give my answers. Um, and yeah. as I transition into midlife, my scale is much more informed by goals in particular and the kind of character that I want to have and this kind of stuff, um, and much less um, a question of my day-to-day -day experiences in part because when you start to do a lot of goal pursuit, your day-to-day -day experiences are often quite stressful and taxing. Um, and so your hedonic experience might actually go down, um, things like that. But again, so again, that seems to me like a kind of change in the, the calibration that I'm using. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Cool. So, thank you. <laughs> well, thanks very much for coming. I'm, uh, I'm glad it was interesting. And, and if you know anyone else who's interested, I'll, I'll point people to the recording. Any other questions? Joel, you unmuted yourself. No? Okay, well, if no one has any more questions, I'll um, close the session. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'll, um, I'll post the video to Twitter and my Google site, and it will be available on the ISQUALS page, and I think as well on the Bennett Institute page at Cambridge.
Thanks everyone for listening. Bye now. I'll stop sharing. I will end the meeting. <laughs>